Christ when you think about being Christian. You know, I'm, I'm not an American Christian. I'm a Christian American. The reason I say that is because being an American don't define me. Being a Christian does. And because of that today, I make my choices because of the fact that Jesus Christ not only died on the cross, but he rose on the third day. And I want to say this to you as we sing this song. It simply says, you do not owe me. A lot of times, you may not do this, but I stumble because I feel like the life that I live or the things that I face I really are, I don't know, maybe, maybe something I don't really need or I don't ask for. But at the end of the day, I think we all agree that God knows what we need better than we know. Amen? Amen. And this song really sets down on my soul sometimes because it makes me go back to a place to where God, when he first called me, I'll never forget Brother Larry coming down to the altar and he praying with me that July 18th of 2004 when God called me to preach. You know, I like a lot of you, we all got dreams, we've got ambitions, we've got desires. But at the end of the day, as much as God has done for us, nobody else has ever given what Christ has given for us. And today we always look at other people and we decide, well, I give more than them or I sing more than them or I'm more faithful than them. And the devil just kind of gets us looking on other things where at the end of the day, we should be seeing Jesus. And this morning, I want to challenge you to just look at what all God has done for you. You say, well, so-and-so failed me. The church failed me. A preacher failed me. Life failed me. I understand all those things are going to fail you, but there's one person and one alone that will never, never fail you. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And think about the times wherever he was mocked and persecuted and he was betrayed and he was uh, pushed in a place to where he could have quit at any given moment. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a movie. It's not some gory scene that Jesus, where he had to carry the cross. The Bible says that literally that you could see his internal organs. I mean, they were exposed because he was beat so bad. And the people looked at him, but he chose to be able to get up and go on and and it got to the place to where he was in such exhaustion that he could have gave up his spirit and stopped because he didn't have to come to this earth and die. He did it because you and I needed a way to be able to have a relationship with God the Father. And I just want you to go back for a moment and instead of asking God why for so much, think about what God's given you. And then maybe make your mind up this morning, God, as much as you've given me, though I've stumbled a little bit, so. So be it, my, my faith has got a little thin. And if you're living a Christian life and you're on the front line, the devil's going to attack you. Amen. And there's going to be times where your faith will get thin and you will have criticism and you will have problems and you'll face things that you don't understand. But you know what? When I look at what he's done, it revives me to keep on going for him. Amen. When he is your purpose, you will continue to go on for the glory of God. Can I get an Amen. And let God speak to you, mind the Lord, as we sing this song. Father, I've wondered why I've had to live such a hard life as one of your children. Shouldn't things be better for me? So many valleys and too many hills. Oh, I thought, but I was wrong, Father. I'm sorry I didn't see. Sit on 
always blessed my heart. Jesus knew he would deny him, but he loved him anyway. The same voice that calmed the storm called out his name, saying, Peter, Satan wants you, but there's one thing he doesn't know. I've been on my knees pleading at the throne. I pray for you. I talk to my Father. Your forgiveness will prove that your faith will not falter. Doubt and fear fall away when intercession is made. And Satan still trembles to this day when Jesus prays. Your burden seems so heavy from the load you've had to bear. But there's a voice that's calling out through your despair. So when you feel that no one's listening and your prayers, they seem unheard, that's when he'll assure you with these words, I prayed for you. I talked to my Father, your forgiveness will prove that your faith will not falter, doubt and fear fall away. When intercession is made And Satan still trembles To this day When Jesus prays Child, I want to share with you A prayer that has the power to Open blind eyes and cause the dead to rise. That's the kind of prayer I pray for you. I pray for you. I talk to my Father. Your forgiveness will prove that your faith will not falter. Doubt and fear fall when intercession is made and Satan still trembles to this day doubt and fear fall away when intercession is made and old Satan still trembles to this day when Jesus prays Oh, my Jesus, pray. Genesis chapter number 11, just a few verses this morning, if you will. I want you to read, starting in verse number 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found the plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. thoroughly. And it says, And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto the heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Bible says in verse number 5, And the Lord came down to the, see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. 
And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, he said, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, and they may not understand one another's speech. You may look this way. A lot of times you'll find out through all the Scripture that everybody seems to know better than what God does. Somebody will try to be able to go against the Lord, think that they might win, and strategically it might look like that the odds are in their favor. Sometimes you'll find that many times that when people come together, even if they have a lot of wisdom and they have a great title, they have a great position, that sometimes they think that strategically that they can come up with something to be able to overcome or maybe do what they feel like they need to do. Now let me put it in perspective. I'm not just talking about uh, walking away from God and completely rebelling against God in a manner to where you're leaving the church and the setting of the church and running to the world. I'm also talking about what you may strategically try to do in the house of God. Just because you do a God thing does not mean it's God's will. And all God's people said, Amen. Anytime God tells you to do something and you go against it, it is always known as one thing and one thing alone, and it's called rebellion. Anytime that you find yourself trying to go against the Word of God or the way of God or the will of God, you're going to find yourself in a state of being in rebellion. And there's never a time that you're ever going to win when you find yourself standing all alone and God's not with you. When we celebrate this Tuesday, it'll be the independence of this country. It'll be the fact that we've literally been able to break away. And as I said this morning when I was praying to our Heavenly Father that what makes this country so great is the Constitution. Now, though we have amended it a thousand times, that just goes to prove that we don't always like things our way, so we come up with a way to change something to make it different. Amen. The Constitution ain't the only thing we do that to. We also do it to the Bible. We also do it to the Word of God. We will change churches. We will change things. We will change friends. We will change Bibles. We'll, we'll do a lot of different things. And a, the amazing thing to me is so many people want to jump on something that they do not know, thinking they know everything. But when you really get down to where the rubber meets the road, you'll find out that God's way is not always man's way. Maybe I should put it this way. Man's way is not always God's way. Amen? But I'm thankful today that when we walk in the ways of the Lord, and we do as the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, that you trust the Lord with all thy heart, lean not to thy own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge Him, and He shall, He will direct your path. You can always end up where you need to end up when you trust in the Lord. God don't need our opinion. God don't need to know what we want. God already knows our wants. He created us. He knows everything about us. Somebody say amen. So by knowing that, we can rest at ease to know that not only did God create us, but God knows what's best for us. So when we celebrate our independence, we can celebrate our independence, but there's many people today that they forget that not only are we trying to be independent from people that will shackle you down and, and from ISIS and from uh, all, all the different uh, countries that's over here for them to have some kind of authority. But there's a lot of us today that are still by, battling a battle, if you will, that we're trying to fight for our own independence and ourself. We're trying to stand alone. We're trying to live what we want to live, do what we want to do, speak what we want to speak. We want to give the way we want to give. We want to function and act the way we want to function. We've even got to a place today to where we have now got the mindset that we could create our own gender. There is man and woman. There's no such thing as a transgender. We, we, we're separating ourselves to where we think that we can come up with all these things and these ideas and these mindsets to where God done something and He didn't finish what God started to do. Let me say this. God done what God needed to do and whatever's left don't need to be taken care of. But we're making ourselves come to a place and we wonder why this country is struggling. We wonder why our churches are struggling. We wonder why our children are struggling. It's because we're trying to have our own identity. We're trying to make up the identity of God. We're trying to make God somebody that God's okay with, with sodomy. God's okay uh, with, with sin. God's okay uh, with, with homosexuality. God's okay with drunkenness. God's okay with, with lying and backstabbing and backbiting. And God's okay with division and God's okay with discord. God's not okay with that. 
He's not okay with that. And just because we want to live the way we want to live does not make God okay with it. But the problem today is it's getting to a place to where not only are we rebelling, but now we are also responding and we are retaliating because we want people to believe the way we, we believe. And be very careful when you try to do God's job for Him. Because the people that you drag down, God does not take it lightly. Anytime that you steer somebody away from God, God's word or God's will, listen, there will always be consequences. Now, I'm not preaching on the home, but I'm going to preach on the home for a minute. Be very careful, those that God has given you authority over, because if you are the headship of your home, it is, it is an absolute that you do what the Bible says for you to do, for you to live the way that God wants you to live and to be able to lead your family. And the day that you step outside of those guys, guidelines, the biblical boundaries that God has given us. Hey, God may not just punish you. Your children may suffer because of what you choose to do against the Word of God. In Genesis 9, verse number 1, the Bible says this, it said, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He says, And a fear of you to the dread that shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the earth, upon thee that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand, and they delivered. Notice, if you will, in verse number one again, and God blessed Noah and his sons, and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish. In other words, they were to be able to uh, scatter. They were to be able to get to a place where they needed to go. The Bible says in chapter number 10, when you study it out, that they all went their separate ways. One went to the European place, and the other one went to the Africa place, if the other one went to the Middle Eastern place, if you will, and they represented the place that the nations would actually go. So here's what God said. God says, I'm in a place, I've got a purpose, and the purpose is to be fruitful and to multiply and to replenish. That's God's plan. God always has a plan. And immediately the Bible says that they begin to do what God told them to do. But then you get the chapter number 11. And when you get to chapter number 11, the Bible says that literally that these same men, when they come to this place, as they divided up, that these men and the people of this country, that they came in verse number 2, and it says, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. So where God had recently said, separate yourselves, replenish, multiply, if you will. Now, all of a sudden, they got the mindset, what we know better than God does, if we're going to make things happen the way they need to happen, we need to be able to come back together, and we need to be able to build a focus point, a, a place that we look at. It is a center location that we have where we can gain power and authority, and we can get some resources, if you will, to be able to go out for things to be the way that they need to be. Point B and make it just really plain this morning. It's kind of like this. God says, I got a purpose for you scattering, but these men chose to rebel and says, you know what? We don't care what God says. We're going to come together. We're going to control this issue, and we're going to take care of what's ours. Anytime you think you know better than God does, let me say this. You're always out of the will of God. If God tells you to be able to give, you ought to give. If God tells you to serve, you ought to serve. If God tells you to forgive, you ought to forgive. If God tells you to go and ask for forgiveness, you ought to go and ask for forgiveness. If God says that marriage is between a man and a woman, that don't make you the right to be able to say it's between a man and a man. It don't make it right between a woman and a woman. I'm not preaching on these things. If God says it's not all right to sow discord and to cause division, then that don't make it okay whatever you think that it's all right because it's of a different topic and it's about your family. No, God says that he hates those sins. He hates those sins. And all through the Scripture you realize that God is holy. And God being holy that God makes it very plain that anything that you do for the Lord has always got to be God's way. Now, I want to say this and just make it known. Ain't nobody perfect. Ain't nobody perfect. There's not one person in here that knows everything, that has it all figured out. There's not one person that is perfect. But I want you to notice about these men, it was premeditated. I wonder in our life, the Bible says that the men begin to travel from the east. They was going to a place of Shinar. There's a plain, there was a plain that was there. In other words, 
They were going away from the place that God told them to be. They were traveling in a direction that was slowly and progressively taking them to the place that they should not be. They were slowly, and I'm not just talking about overnight. It's a progress. You don't just wake up one day in the middle of a bunch of sin because you just woke up there. It's just like we've preached in the book of James where the Bible says that you can be enticed. If you do not control what's in your eyes, it will control your mind. And once it takes your mind, you will then begin to yield to temptation if you do not silence the temptation that is in your life. And when, as the Bible says, that you do that at that moment, then sin is conceived. Now I want to ask you this question. This is not for everybody to stand up this morning, including myself, and I say thank God, and to express the way that we're walking our life or living our life. But I would ask you this question this morning is, Has there been something that God has been trying to ask you to do that maybe you have been in this roller coaster ride? Maybe you have been in this circle you've been walking. Maybe you have been in a situation that you can't get out of. Maybe your home is a wreck. Maybe your life is a wreck. Maybe your marriage is a wreck. Maybe everything's good, but you can't get no peace. Maybe on the outside, everything's got it made and everything's okay. But on the inside, it's chaos. It's turmoil. It's things going over and over and over. You cannot get peace for nothing. You don't know what's going on. It may just be God's told you to do something, but you're trying to walk away from what God told you to do. You ever ever think that sometimes we spend more effort trying to go around God than we do trying to do what God has called us to do? You know, and I, I can get up on any Sunday morning, any Sunday night, any Wednesday night, and I can preach about grace and help and strength and love and compassion and restoring and forgiveness. And man, people are so excited. But see, it amazes me that, that a lot of times people love preaching as long as you ain't preaching on their sin. And people love church as long as the church is what they think it ought to be. Yeah. People will submit to authority as long as the authority is doing what they think they need to do. We we, we treat life the way we treat God. And we're getting to a place now to where a lot of us are literally asking God what God wants us to do. And then we are compromising as if God compromises with us. They say, okay, God, I'm going to do this. We're still gonna, I'm still going to make sure everything's all right, God. But, you know, I don't need to do that. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to take care of this. And me and so-and-so will be fine. But, Lord, we're just, instead of just facing each other and making it right, God, we're just, we're just going gonna to stay absent from them. No, God said go and seek forgiveness. If you have all in your heart, y'all, to go to your brother. Bible don't change, friend. You can't, you you can't, you cannot, listen, I'm trying to get, you cannot get this this thought in your mind to where you can be an individual and live the way you want to live. Now, I'm saying this, and let me make it relevant for a minute. As a husband, if you want to be able to have a godly marriage, you know what you need to do? You need to do what God told you to do. You need to be who God's called you to be. You need to act the way God told you to act. You need to become Christ as Christ was for the church. You need to be that for your wife and love her, to sanctify her. That means to be able to set her apart to where you live live in a position where she sees God through you, and instead of rebelling against God, she will be drawn to you. That's what you ought to do as a husband. But it's the same thing in anything with leadership. You have to position yourself so that people can see God through you. And if not, not only are you derailing yourself, but you're also derailing those who are following you. You're setting people on the pace to where they're in a life of destruction. The Bible says that when, and you'll break it down in a minute, the Bible says that when they begin to respond this way, that literally God dropped confusion right in the middle of them. I want you to notice these things. Number one, the rebellion of man. I want you to look at verse number three. The Bible says this. And they said one to another, go to and let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And it says, and they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. Verse number three, the Bible says that literally the rebellion of man, they started talking. And when they started talking, they, they didn't necessarily like God's way. Matter of fact, they were educated men. They, they knew that they would be better off doing some things this way or that way or actually making it to where it would be like a slime or a tar. It would be something that would be more substantial because they were going to literally try to, to build a tower. They, they were going to make things in a, in a great movement. Now, it all starts from one thing, and this is what I want you to get out of this. The Bible says that they, notice verse number three, and they said one to another. 
and they said one to another, and they said one to another, and they said one to another. A lot of times, you'll always talk to people that agree with you even if they don't agree with God. Be careful who you choose that you associate with. Be careful who you talk to. Maybe I should go a little bit deeper. Put people in your life that ain't in your circle. That way they can keep you accountable. When you believe what you believe, they're willing to tell you that's not what the Bible says. Amen. Because I want to live right. Listen, I don't want my church and my family and my children to suffer because of my rebellious nature. I don't want that. I want to stay in the center of the will of God. You say, well, this is elementary preaching. Teen camp was last week. We don't need to be able to learn about our friends. But the amazing thing to me is, is that when we get to be adults, we're still choosing the wrong people to run around with. And we wonder why we end up in the mess or we wonder we start believing the mess that we believe. Sometimes, sometimes we forget that the people that made the greatest impact in our life was the people that taught us the scriptures. The older men that was in this church, I, I wanted to be around them. When I, when I went to Sunday school, I went to Brother Robbie's Sunday school. You know why? One, because there wasn't a lot of young people in the church at the time, amen. But number two, because I learned from godly men. They didn't tell me what I needed to hear. I mean, what I wanted to hear. They didn't tell me what I thought was right. They didn't tell me what I was okay to hear. They didn't agree with me on everything. But I'll tell you what they did. They, they sought out the Scriptures. They taught me what the Word of God said. And they loved me where I was to where God took me and where God wanted me to be. Sometimes rebellious, a rebellious spirit will always start with the people you choose to communicate with. Now, since we're quiet this morning, I'll go deeper. That means who you talk to on the phone, who you conversate with. I, you know, you want, you want your temper to change, but you always call somebody, it's okay with you having a temper. Am I telling it right? You want, you, you, you want your mouth to clean up, but yet you always hang around the people, it's okay with you cussing. You want to be a biblical man, but yet you hang around people that ain't a biblical man. You want to be a biblical lady, but yet you hang around people that ain't a biblical lady. And you want things to change. you got to be careful who you run with. Amen. When you look at this, you look at verse number 4. The Bible says this, that this is their strategy. Literally, they, the rebellion of man, the Bible says, for they said, let us go and, and build us a city and a tower and whose top may reach unto heaven and make us a name lest we be scattered abroad. They didn't want to be scattered abroad, but wait a minute, didn't God say scatter abroad? Didn't God say you need to separate? So they're admitting to each other, we don't want what God says. Right. Are you seeing how red flag that is? We don't want what God says. In chapter number 9, verse number 1, the Bible says that he plainly said that you are to replenish, you are to multiply, you are to be able to go and do these things. But in chapter number 11, they are talking to each other and they're saying, we don't want what God says. It's amazing to me how we choose to still have the same people in our life and they bluntly say they don't agree with what God's Word says. Are you hearing me? They, they bluntly admit they do not agree with what God's Word says. And we're okay with it. The Bible says that they wanted to do these things. Notice this. They wanted to build a city. Why did they want to build a city? They wanted a point of reference. They wanted civilization to be the center of the world. That way they can have a point of reference. You know what our point of reference is? It's the Bible. Everybody say Bible. These men, they, they wanted a place where everybody could look to. They wanted guidance. Listen, the Bible don't tell us to look to a man. The Bible don't tell us to look to the White House. The Bible don't say look in your own house. The Bible says if you need, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask it of God. That's what the Bible says. These men wanted to build a city because they wanted a centralized location for everybody to be able to look to. The second thing it says, they want to be able to build a name. To build a name, we've studied in the Old Testament where names define it's an act of sovereignty or power. In other words, it defines who we actually are. It defines the existence of us. In other words, who we are ourselves. So in other words, they, they, they wanted to create themselves. They wanted to make themselves. They, they, wanted to, they wanted to get credit for everything that they were. In today, 2017, so maybe you could get this. In our careers, we want to we we take credit for everything we got. Right. 
in our homes, we want to take credit for everything we got. In, in, our, in our lives, in our, in our finances, we want to take credit for everything we got. You say, well, I'm not trying to change my name. I'm not trying to change my name. No, but you sure will say that you, uh, you, you've taken care of things yourself, that you are a self-defined man, that you have established yourself yourself. You, you've done this. You've gained this. You've accomplished it. No, you and I ain't done nothing except for the grace of God. God's given it to us. And the day that we start thinking that we have the sovereignty, the power to be able to say who we really are is the day that we get too big for our britches and God splits this church right down the middle and hangs by the church as it used to be and not what it is now. Amen. Amen. Listen, we're not no better than any other church. I'm not better than any other pastor. You're not better than any other Christians. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God. Amen, 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 amen. You say, well, my sin is not drunkenness, and my sin is, is not lying, and my sin, well, I know, your sin might not be that sin, but you got some kind of sin. And, and you, you got to be able to see it to where I'm not defining me. I, I'm not trying to establish who we are. I don't need a cookie-cutter mold for people to come to church. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever means whosoever. Let them come, but let God change them and clean their life up. Amen? But that does not mean we compromise the truth. The third thing that you see, they said we want to build a tower. Why? The Bible says that they wanted to build a tower, notice in verse number four, to be able to reach heaven. In other words, they wanted some kind of religious symbol to where it would show and reveal that they believed that there needed to be some kind of power. But here's the deal. We don't get to heaven to get power. Heaven gets to us to give us power. We don't have authority to make God move. God's ha God has authority to make us move. Are y'all with me? So the problem was, is they wanted to be their own person, do their own thing. They wanted to have their own identity. Now time out for a second because this is going to blow right over your head and I'm just about done. I know nobody wants to stand up and say that I got this problem in my life. But I wonder how many of us could really stand before God right now, look God in the face and say, I'm completely surrendered to you and everything in my life. Because if you can't do that, you got a problem with this in your life. You won't give up those friends, won't give up that boyfriend, won't give up that girlfriend, won't give up that pay raise, won't give up that job, won't give up that position. I've seen preachers won't give up a ministry when God's done with them in a, in a, in a, in a church because they think, no, I need to be here. And listen, I, I, I've, seen, I've seen men stay too long in the pulpit and it, and it hindered the church. Y'all might not agree with me, but I'm telling you, I, I, I've seen it happen. Because they, they think they know better than God. Listen, if God's got us this far, God will take care of us the rest of the way. And what I'm trying to tell you today is no matter how far we go, no matter how far we've come, no matter what we go through or what we accomplish or what we ever learn, listen, we always have to have a dependency upon the Lord. We will never be set apart to be I and me and me alone. It's never going to be. You must lean upon the Lord. Let me go to this, the second thing, the response of God. Notice this, the rebellion of man, but number two, the response of God. Notice in verses six and seven, the Bible says this. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one, and they have one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. In other words, they're accomplishing what they want to accomplish. So God's response says, verse number seven, go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. You know what God does in response? He brings confusion. Miss Deborah, you come if you're around here. Listen, he brings confusion. If you could tie this together, before you turn me off this morning, I want you to listen to this. Sometimes God will allow confusion in things. God's not the author of, he's not. But God will allow there to be so you know that it's not of the Lord. Are you hearing me? 
If a marriage is on the rocks and it don't seem to come together and it seems to be confusing, nobody knows what to do. It's her fault. It's my fault. It's his fault. It's her fault. It's their fault. It's the kid's fault. The kid says it's my parents' fault. I mean, let's think about it. Let's be real for a minute. God allowed it because somebody got out of line with God. In a business, in a home, in a church. You ever wonder why there seems to be so much confusion? Maybe because that's God revealing that there's rebellion that's among the men. I mean, you might not like to hear this, but it'll be all right. If the music man ain't in one accord with the, with, with the pastor, there might be confusion. If the seniors director and the youth leaders and the junior church workers and the king's kids workers and the deacons, if we're, if we're not all in one accord, there might be confusion. Sometimes you sit around and say, well, I want, what, 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 how do they say it? There's a, dead, there's a dead monkey on the line somewhere. And that how they say it? <laughs> there's a dead monkey on the line somewhere. You can say what you want, but when the rubber meets the road, when you get to that confusing state to where you don't know what to do, there's a lot of blaming that goes on. She's blaming him, they're blaming them, they're blaming her, her blaming them. I mean, everybody's blaming everybody. Can you imagine what, what happened when God showed up and all these people, everything's good, and all of a sudden God brought down and everybody can't even understand. It's confusion, it's chaos. Nobody knows what to do, where to go. And I'll tell you why. Because they got out of the will of God. And anytime God tells you something, it's going to take submission. It's always going to take submission. You have to submit to what God tells you to do. You say, Brother Jason, for a Sunday morning, this sure is a very elementary message. It's elementary because, again, we always like preaching unless it's something that's really pertaining to us. Amen. There's not a man that's in here today, and I can't even see your heart, but if he loves his family, there's not a man in here today that does not seek the direction of the Lord because he knows when he gets out of line, it could affect his entire family. Every single day, you have to choose to die. If not, you're going to cause havoc. There's going to be problems. There's going to be pain. Yeah, you might get your way, but let me say this. What happens whenever you begin to get weak? What happens when you begin to stagger? What happens when you begin to die? There's a lot of times I'll see them in families. There'll be a daddy or a grandpa. Man, he's like the spiritual giant. And everybody goes to church. And everybody's serving the Lord. And everybody's there on Sunday morning. And everybody's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. And as soon as God takes that role model, everybody's scattered. You know why? Because they look more to a man than they did to God. God allowed that confusion. Why would God take my daddy? Why would God take my mama? Maybe because God knew they'd be better off with him, but he needed you to look to him, and things were getting a little bit out of whack. You were almost making him like an idol, and he's not God. Are y'all with me this morning? I say this in being done. The Bible says in verse number 7, that literally did he scatter them to a place to where they weakened them. He says, they let us go down there, confound their language, and they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them, verse number 8, abroad thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to the build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them upon the face of the earth. You may look this way and I'll be done. I, I want to say the return to God's way will be my third point that I would say to you. In chapter number 9, verse number 1, God had a plan. And you hear me when I say this because my stubbornness has taught me this the hard way. In chapter number 9, verse number 1, God had a plan. He said to be fruitful, to be able to multiply, to replenish. God had a plan for them to be able to scatter among all the face of the earth. Well, chapter number 11, verse number 9, the Bible says the same thing that God said in chapter 9 is what actually happened. Here's the point. Whether you want to submit to it or not, God's always going to do what God wants to do. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to help you here. Stay with me. 
We can choose to go through the tough times of life and God cause confusion and us cause heartache. And let's just be honest. Sometimes when we do things the way we want to do things, it brings scars that we're not proud of. It brings pain that we, we, really, we really don't like to hear. Uh, I, I, I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of teenagers think they know better than being under the submission of their home. They graduate and then they walk out the door and they run out there thinking they know better. I can handle it. I can do it. I know better than my mom and dad. I know better than what God said. I know better. I know better. Little to find out that just a few months or a few years down the road, they come crawling back in with a bunch of scars that this world has left on them because they chose to do what God did not tell them to do. And look up here, this ain't no simple elementary message. That brings us pain. That brings me pain. When you invest in these people and you want the best for their life, listen, as a church, as a body of Christ, we don't want people to be hurt. We don't want people to be separated. We don't want people to fight. We don't want people to be able to be in discord and and have a bunch of shame and feel like that they don't belong in the house of God. But you know what? You had to choose to walk away. If we can keep people from walking away from the Lord and just choose to submit to the Lord. Why? Because God's always going to do what God wants to do. You know, the Bible says in Philippians chapter number 2 that every knee shall bow. It says that everyone will call Him Lord. Right? You believe that? Say amen. Everybody. He wants you to call Him Lord now. But either way it goes, we're all going to call Him Lord. Let me say this. Even those, the Bible says, under the earth, even those in hell will call Him Lord. There won't be no atheists in hell. They'll all know there's a God. Are are you with me? There there won't be no more, there's no such thing as, they'll know there's a God, and they will call Him Lord. Now here's what I'm trying to get to you. Why must we go through hell to do what God wants us to do? That's the message. Why must we go through hell to do what God wants us to do? Search your heart this morning. You say, well, Brother Jason, I don't know if that encourages me too much. Well, listen, 1 John 1, 9 sure will encourage you if you realize that God still forgives. It's never too late to get back in the center of God's will. Heads bow and eyes. As the pastor, I want to thank you for viewing our video today. However, if God's dealt with your heart, we do not want to end this video without giving you a chance to be able to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. If you're there today and God's actually dealing with your heart, I want to remind you what the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us has had problems, issues, sin, failures, faults in our past. The great thing is this, is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming through the Father but by me. There is a way to be able to have hope, to have eternal security within the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to know that you're saved by the grace of God. Now the great thing about the Bible is it tells us about the love of God. He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that's amazing to a lot of people and they can quote it. But the beauty of it is this, is the very next verse tells us the purpose of Christ. Because the Bible says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through Him might be saved. That means that God sent His Son to die for those of us who are sinners so that we can have fellowship with God Himself. Now, if you're there today and God's really been dealing with your heart, I want to ask you this question. Do you really believe that God's been dealing with you about salvation? If that's the case today, then I want to tell you what you need to do is repent of your sins. You need to die to yourself. Admit that you are lost and you're on your way to hell. And then look at what the Bible tells us, that He tells us that we can be saved through Christ. Who do you call on? There's only one. As the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ and Christ alone. So I tell you today, would you trust in Christ? I want to ask you, would you, would you trust in Him as a personal Savior? You say, Brother Jason, I don't really know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you, the Bible also tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It don't matter who you are, where you come from, God sent His Son to die for everyone. If you've made this decision today to be able to trust in Christ, to be able to die to yourself, to to be able to start living for Christ and accept Him as a personal Savior after repenting, would you do us a favor and be able to contact us at 336-788-0551 and let us know about this decision that you made so we can start praying for you. Thank you so much.